Good morning. Thank you. Somebody was nice and loud. All right. Everybody's here early this morning. It is wonderful to see. I wonder why that is. Maybe an extra hour of sleep. Maybe this is the last year for that. We'll see. All right. Well, welcome, guests. Uh, please fill out a Grace Connection card located in the seat back in front of you. There's a picture of it up there. Uh, also, everyone is welcome to write paper prayer requests on the back of the card and drop it in the welcome center slot or in the offering bag that comes around. Today is the last day to pick up your boxes for Operation Christmas Child. <laughs> Collection day is next Sunday, November 13th. So make sure you get your boxes in or pick up a box and, and bring it back next week. Um, the Operation Christmas Child packing party um, everyone is invited to join the fun at this packing party on Thursday, November 10th at 2 p.m. So see Amanda um, for more information. Is Amanda here? No, nope, she's not here. Uh, want to, if you want to contribute to bulk box making, um, see yesterday's news feed for a link to sign up for items. Also save the date for the Iwana Grand Prix here this Saturday, November 12th from 9 to noon. The entire church family is invited to come and watch the race and cheer our clubbers on. So that's always fun. Sometimes the crashes are more, more fun than the, than the race itself, but um, I encourage you to come here next Saturday for that. Um, so family chores. So a lot of stuff going on here. So family chores. Sign up at the Welcome Center or text. Um, it's a phone number up there. Text that phone number. Um, if you want to sign up for it. So we need help setting up tables, chairs on Wednesday, November 16th at 8 p.m. Uh, on Friday, November 19th at 10 in the morning, they're going to be decorating the tables. Uh, also can use kitchen help, can use help cleaning up, and there's other miscellaneous things that we need help for. And this is all because of the Feast of Thanks dinner, which I'll go over here shortly. Uh, we also be decorating for Christmas on November 20th at 10.30, uh, following the morning worship service during our na normal Sunday studies time. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to work together, so please stay and join us. Also that same day, a lot of things going on, is the Feast of Thanks dinner. So that, again, is on November 20th at 11.30, following the Christmas decoration decorating. So please sign up at the Rut Welcome Center to bring various dishes. And the last thing on here is today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. There are flyers on the pews uh, that give updates and also some booklets that contain 52 weeks of prayer requests for persecuted Christians. The booklets, booklets are very eye-opening to the situations that many believers are in. If you want to pray effectively for the Christians around the world who are under much persecution, please take a booklet home and pray weekly for our brothers and sisters. So any other announcements? All right, I'll ask the men to come forward. Heavenly Father, it's an exciting time, a lot of things going on here at the church, and I, and I thank you for all these opportunities to serve you, Lord. We do serve a wonderful, loving God and, and who gives us blessings each and every day, Lord. Uh, I ask for a blessing on this monetary gift that we bring before you, Lord. May it be used to bring you honor and glory and bring others under your fold. Lord, just thank you for um, this time this morning. I pray for Pastor Jed and the words that he gives, and I ask you to open our hearts and, and bring in your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Colossians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 13 and 14. Paul writes, and although you were dead by reason of your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Isn't that beautiful? He nailed it to the cross. There is power in that cross. And that's what we're going to sing this morning. I would invite you to stand. The power of the cross.
A past that held regret over my head is gone. These chains are ashes now that once were rusted on. I was a runaway, now I am finally born. My mind was a ghost town, haunted by yesterday. Until your hand reached down, pulled me out of my grave. Into the freedom found, only in Jesus' name. I am forgiven, no longer lost. chapter 7, this is the account where Daniel is seeing the vision of the four beasts. And as, we, as Daniel records that account, he gets down to verses 13 and 14, and the heading of that, path, that portion of scripture says, the Son of Man presented. And it reads as, as follows, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom, so that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. What a tremendous truth, what a tremendous blessing for us as believers to know that his dominion is everlasting and it will never pass away. And that his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And one day... One day he's coming, a oh, glorious day.
One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we sing this morning, we get a chance to do that. We could get a chance to confess that he is King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt.
King of kings, Lord of lords. Oh God, we, we come before you this morning in prayer because of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, what a wonderful thing that we can put melody and words to, to our worship of you. And God, as we do, oh, you grow bigger and bigger in our hearts and our minds as we, we elevate you, we exalt you. God, thank you for the privilege to come this morning as your church family and worship you. God, as we come before you, we think of our missionaries, and God, what a blessing that so many have been reaching out to, to those who are serving you on various fields in different locations. God, today we, we think of Ryan and Amanda as they, they serve in our church plant over there in, in the springs. God, you know the difficulty that, that they are facing this morning. So, Lord, we, we bring that whole church family before you as they, they deal with this, as they seek to bring you glory and honor through a very difficult situation. Lord, we pray that you would give them peace and wisdom and strength. Lord, I, I think of those just in our church here. This week has been very difficult for some. Lord, I, I pray that you would strengthen and comfort those who are going through a difficult time. God, that you would, you would just offer your healing. Lord, we, we think of, of the elections coming up. And Lord, we, we look at our country and we, we don't find peace in, in our country, we find peace and hope in you. And we ask, Lord, that we as your church would be wise as we, as we vote. God, that we would seek to be a nation that looks to you. And God, may it start here within our church. As we come to our passage today, God... I pray that I would be very small and you would be great. You would be grand in our eyes, our minds, and our hearts. So we commit this time to you, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to dismiss our children up through the third grade. And for some of you that weren't here on the day that we, we actually addressed this, this tr tree over here, this is our Thanksgiving tree. As, as leaves fall, thanks goes up, right? Praise goes up. So if you have not put a, something on here or if you have more things, believe it or not, I think each of us each week can find something we're grateful for. But if you want to write that down and hang a leaf on there, feel free to do that. Um, we, uh, part of the decorating for our Feast of Thanks here in a couple of weeks is we take those things and we, we decorate the placemats with the things that people are grateful for. And uh, it's always uh, such a blessing. This morning, in our passage in Philippians, and Mark read a portion of that passage uh, as we, we sang praises, but we are looking at Greatness. We're considering greatness as God sees it. And, and, I, and I pondered, what is it that we consider great? When we consider an individual, what makes them great in, in man's eyes or the world in which we live? Oftentimes, we, we find that it's equated with, with fortune or, or your worth. Often, we, we see it's, it's based on popularity or fame. We'll consider someone that everybody knows to be great. Accomplishments, we look at the individual's life. 
the things they have done and achieved, and, and we, we praise those accolades. And we consider that individual great. Power, authority, is often associated with those who are considered great in this world. To achieve that level of, of power, that one would look to the individual in awe. It's often strived for. Sometimes it just comes down to people's opinion. Which is a scary thing sometimes. But we look at those things and we consider those who, who have those things, have those marks, as great individuals. Those who have achieved greatness. And as we look at our passage today... We're going to look at greatness in a contradictory way, so to speak. It's not going to be what we would think as things to pursue. It's not what we teach in our schools and our colleges. In fact, it's quite contrary. Paul, as he is writing... He's been reminding us of who we are. We're children of God. We are citizens of heaven. And in this passage here, he speaks to greatness. Join with me in chapter 2 of Philippians as we look at our passage. Paul begins with, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affliction and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, Intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking, on, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love this passage. Honestly, when I, when I came to Philippians, this passage was like, yes, I get to preach on, on this one. It is such a powerful, powerful passage. And, and in theological terms, it is packed. So as I came this morning, or this week, or last week, I've been trying to put together the sermon while hunting and everything else, and I've been thinking about this passage for, for months now. I'm like, how should I approach this passage of Scripture? How should I unravel the truths and make it applicable for, for you and I? How should we look at this so that when Monday morning comes, 
this passage will resonate in our hearts and our minds. You see, as we unpack this passage, we, we see a, a truth. It, theologians call it the kenosis. The, the kenosis is that emptying out. God becoming man without ceasing to be God. He set aside those divine attributes of God, not holding on to them, as he came in the flesh. We see the, the incarnation, which here in just in, in about a month we celebrate at Christmas time. The Word, God Himself coming in the flesh. As we look at this passage, we see these things, we see these theological truths. Essential for you and I to understand and believe. The kenosis, God as man. 100% God, 100% man. Can I wrap my mind fully around it? No, I cannot. But God had to come. And as coming as God, he was void of sin. The incarnation coming as man. God had to come as man to take man's penalty for sin. And as God, he was able to do both. Sinless. Fully God, fully man. As much as I would love to spend, my goodness, hours talking about this, going from passage to passage, Looking through the scriptures, I would much rather have a conversation and engage with this. This would be a great one for our Sunday study time, just to talk about this and go to the different passages. And on Monday morning, you need to understand this is the God that we serve. This is the God that paid for your salvation. But I also want to look at it from a very practical point. How do you and I pursue greatness? What is it that your life and my life should look like if we are to pursue that? Paul, as he, he, he writes this, lays it out beautifully. I, I love Paul's structure of writing. It's so easy to follow. He begins with that, that if-then phrasing, which is so challenging and so crystal clear. He, he gives us a beautiful example in Jesus Christ himself, and then he, he closes this with the outcome that you and I need to consider. But Paul begins this argument with, by starting with, therefore. Therefore. Remember last week's passage when we looked at, we unfolded the fact that you and I are, are children of God. What, what an amazing title to have. His children. As such, we are part of his family. We are citizens of heaven. And we looked at all that entailed. And Paul ended that with reminding you and I that we have been granted, we have been gifted salvation. And as we receive that salvation, that relationship with Jesus Christ, we are also granted suffering. And that's where we left it. And we enter into suffering. We enter into those hardships. As, as we follow Christ, there will be suffering. So as Paul reminds us of this, he says, Therefore, with this high position of honor, with this, this title of a child of God, 
I want you to keep some things in mind. If. As, as we read through those if statements, I, I don't know if you noticed how I'm, the various ifs that were given there. But Paul is not, as he's writing this, giving us things to question. These are not questionable things. These are realities. He's making a statement of these are realities that you and I possess as children of God. Did you see those? If there's any fellowship in the Spirit, if there's any consolation in love, if, if, over and over, he's saying these things are not questionable, they're reality. Think about the things you and I can hold on to. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, today when you leave here and you go about whatever it is, if there's encouragement in Christ, the reality is there is encouragement that you and I are able to grasp and hold on to in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's encouraging to think about what he has done, how much he has loved. If there is comfort in his love, have you considered how much he loves you? The words of the songs that you saw on the screen as you, as you voiced those words in worship. Did you ponder how much he loved you? I love the song King of Kings as, as it comes to the point where, where Jesus Christ, we're singing about his resurrection and the church being born. What love that he would do that for you and me. Is there comfort in his love? Fellowship in the Spirit. If you have fellowship in the Spirit, if, if, if having that, that intimate relationship, the Holy Spirit indwelling you, fellowship, Did you take time this week to fellowship with him? It's a reality. If there's affection and compassion, if these things are yours, because they are, they are realities for the believer in Jesus Christ. The child of God holds these things. I will say if you are sitting here this morning or if you're listening and these these are things you're like I don't have that. If the if is a question uh, over and over and over consider your relationship with Jesus Christ. Consider his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, his payment that he paid for sin for you and for me. As we place our faith in Jesus Christ, these are realities for us. For the believer, we have these things. And, and as such, because we attain, we, we hold on to these, these are realities in your life and my life, because of that, then there should be an outcome. And Paul addresses that. There are three things that should result, as Paul states here, in your life and mine. First, joy complete. In the believer's life, we should live out a complete joy. Not based on circumstances, not based on, on where we are, what we're going, not the situation, but complete joy. Verse 
And did you notice what brings complete joy? Paul mentioned it last time, and he's mentioning it again, a same mind, a same love, united in the Spirit, one purpose. Have you noticed that the joy is, is linked, it's knit together with the unity of the body of Christ? The unity of the family of God. In your own homes, when there is disunity, you do not feel or experience joy, do you? When there's a difference of mind, a difference of love, when there's no fellowship with the Spirit, a different purpose, joy is not present. And Paul is speaking here to the church, the family of God. He says your unity is, is part of and makes joy complete. You're like, man, there's a lot of unity talk in this thing. I mean, my goodness, yeah, it's kind of important. Paul also understood in order to have a life and a church family that's unified, there's things that need to be avoided. Two things he, he references to avoid and they're very basic. I know, I'm not unwrapping a lot of deep theological truth this morning. It's amazing when God wants you to live for him, he gives us very practical things. The first thing to avoid is don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. A me first mentality, it's all about me. So often we get even caught up in, in just our own self-importance. If you want to see disunity, pursue yourself. The other thing to avoid, I like this one. Don't try to impress people. Don't get wrapped up in conceit. You know, so often we have a hard time seeing others, others' needs, hurts, joys, blessings, because we're looking at us. Or we're concerned how others are going to view us. Oh, get past that. How does God view you? What does He think? We concern ourselves so much with the outward impression. I can't tell you how many times I have had the privilege of watching through windows families argue in the parking lot. No, I'm being serious. They argue in the parking lot. You see their faces and they're like, I mean, it looks like they just bit into a lemon. And as they walk and they get closer to the door, it's like all of a sudden you added sugar to that lemon and they just smile and oh, everything. It, really? Why not come in, find a, a, a family who has experienced, gone through some of that, go up to them and say, hey, we are really having a hard time today. Can you pray for us? It could work. And, and all of you are like, you looked at me? Well, maybe not you directly, but I've seen some of you. Yes. Why not come and be realistic and say, listen, it's been a tough morning. I love telling people, my wife and I don't have arguments on the way to church. We come at different times now. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Solve that one. <laughs> but when we did, it, it happens sometimes. 
But you know, what would happen to the unity of the body of Christ if we would avoid trying to impress people and actually come and be real? You know, I, I, there, I can think of a few times when my wife and I came to church and we had had those rough mornings with our, with our children as they were younger. And, and going up to, you know, a, a grandparent-type couple and just saying, how did you do it? What did you guys do? And, you know, they looked at us and said, there's nothing you can do. It's just how it is, and you will get through this. It's a, it's a season of life, and it's okay. And then they would pray with us. You know what? If nothing else, because they really didn't give us any advice to change the situation, we felt like we were a little more normal, that we weren't screwing up as bad as we thought. But stop trying to impress people. Stop being selfish. And you know what? Look out for someone else. If you see them coming up with a hard day, go and give them a hug and tell them how much you love them. Maybe you're having a hard day too and you want that. Well, don't be selfish. Instead of looking too long in the mirror, I think we need to look at our majesty, our God. The more we look at him, the less we look at ourselves, at least in high esteem, really. And then Paul says, but pursue this. Pursue this. He says, pursue a, a humble mindset. Keep a humble mind. That's basically saying, God, you are great, you are big, I'm small. And keep it in that perspective. Keep a humble mindset. He says, think of others over yourself. That's hard to do. He says, not only over yourself, but even greater, of greater importance. Let me ask you, as you walk through those doors today, how many of you were so excited to think of everybody else but yourself? I am going to go and try to find everybody I can encourage knowing that you've had a hard week. Knowing that there were difficulties and burdens. But when you engage with others, you think of them more than you. That's not natural. We live in a me first society we have books that that even have titles take care of number one there's an award that's given out i loved i loved the the title of it it's the i'm third award i think i called it right is it that I, i'm third where you consider God first. First and foremost. Others second. And yourself third. What a perspective. Think of others over yourself. How many of you, when you approach someone, your first thing is to tell them how you've, your week has been? To tell them your difficulties? Rather than pause and hear about them. Could you come on a Sunday morning and be satisfied if all you did was ask people how they were so you could pray for them and leave with no one asking you? Could you be satisfied? Or would you be hurt, offended, and be just upset? others first you know someone else might be having that hard day too maybe not as hard as yours even but it could be a hard day a hard week 
says, don't neglect yourself. God doesn't want you and I to neglect ourselves, okay? We don't go to the point of where we don't even care for our own bodies, our own needs and such, but we don't place it in such high regard that we don't consider anyone else's. Look around. No, really, look around right now. I want you to consider that there's people around you. People probably that you don't even know some. Others you do. We have some visitors this morning. It's great. Got to know some of them. But did you ask anybody how their week was? We have a fellowship time coming up in just a little bit. A great opportunity. Joy complete through unity. Avoid being selfish or impressing. Oh, and pursue that humble mindset, thinking of others. Not neglecting yourself or others. You know, it's good to remember that. Because after a message of hearing that you're a child of God, a citizen of heaven, his family, I mean, that kind of gives you a cool status, doesn't it? An amazing, amazing place that you realize you are, and Paul says, but keep it in place. Don't think too highly of yourself, and he gives us an amazing example. You and I are to look to Christ, not, oops, lights went out. Oh, there we go. Our example, Jesus Christ. You know, as, as we look at Christ, Paul is not saying that you and I, as Christ is our example, are little gods. That's not what he's saying. But he is giving us an example to challenge us to have an attitude like Christ. An attitude. It comes down to the attitude, does it not? I mean, I remember growing up and, and my parents would say to me, you're not in trouble for what you said but for how you said it. Attitude. How many of you ever had your parents say that? Uh-huh. See, we all know how that goes, don't we? Our attitude, it's what's inside our heart that comes out, it's expressed, and Jesus gives us an example to live by. The kenosis, setting aside those divine attributes. I can't even fathom being God and setting aside those things to become man for you and I. Those things, he said, not to be considered something to grasp. He could have. He had every right being God, but he did it. John chapter 1 describes this beautifully. John 1.1 1, 1 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. All things that came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Did you catch that? In him was life. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 14. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh. Jesus Christ never ceased to be God. Think about it. The one who created life when he walked on this earth healed lives. The very one who created the sea would go out and had command over the waves and the storm. The very one who had all the power setting aside that power to feel weak, hungry, tired. The one who had every right in the universe and beyond. Every right. Laid aside his rights for sinners. Not for good people, not for people who would love him, but for sinners. God, creator, king, ruler. Step down to earth to serve. Even as in his death, we see a glimpse of his deity. I love when they come to, to arrest Jesus in the garden. He asks, who is it that you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he opens his mouth just for a minute and he says, I am he. Mentioning the very name of God, and as he does, bam! They fall on their faces. They cannot stand when he gives them a glimpse of his deity. But not holding on to that, tells Peter, put that sword away. And he goes. And he dies on the cross. With the shame, pain, and suffering, the humility that would come with it. What a powerful example of humbleness and greatness, all wrapped up. And our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul says, consider his attitude. His humility, his obedience. All the rights in the world. And he does it for you and me. But the outcome. The outcome, he is lifted up. Paul says, above all. The outcome is that he is lifted up by all, up above all, and he's worshipped by all. Did you see that? Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. Regardless of how great man thinks he is on this earth, and no matter what position he attains to here, he will bow his knee before Jesus Christ. He will declare with his tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he will be worshipped. Let me encourage you. Declare that now before it's too late. Because if you think too highly of yourself right now, there will be a point where God will knock you down to size. There will be a point where God will cause that knee to bow. I 
I love how Proverbs talks about arrogance and pride over and over. How it's so much better to sit at the foot of the table and have the host invite you to the head. God is the one who lifts up, not you and I. Wait for him. I want to close our time together in remembrance. As we close and partake of communion here in just a moment, and if you didn't grab a communion as you came in, just, just raise your hand and the ushers will, will bring one by for you. But, you know, we, we started by listing the things the world considers great. We're closing. With looking at the greatest man who ever walked on this earth. The words of one solitary life capture it well. I, I want to read to you before we, we go to communion. It says he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years he had, was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of these things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials by himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery, a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the mo navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Jesus Christ, the greatest man, the greatest God you and I could ever know. I found it fitting as we consider Christ in all his greatness to draw you and I to a place of remembrance. Remembering what made him great. It's the sacrifice and love that he gave at Calvary. We remember it as he would sit there with those friends. The ones that would abandon him yet later would take the message to the world. But he took some bread, and then he broke it. That night as he sat there with him, he, he said something that wouldn't make sense. He says, this is my body which is broken for you. Why would a great man allow himself to be broken. Oh, but our great God, in all his wisdom, his love, his mercy and grace, allowed his body to be broken for your sin and mine. Let's ask a blessing on the bread, shall we?
Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we come and we remember your Son. We remember the way that he served us in such a beautiful way. Even that night as he served those he loved, as he would offer up his body, broken and beaten for us. Those who needed salvation. So God, as we remember this this morning, we ask a blessing on the bread and we praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Shall we partake together? If you would take the cup. He said, this cup is a covenant my love for you. His blood poured out for your sin and mine. Without it, there is no redemption. He said, as often as you drink it, remember. Remember what it costs. Let's ask a blessing on the cup. Oh God, that you would come in the flesh. That you would allow your blood to be shed for my sin, for our sin, for the sin of mankind. God, that kind of love, oh we thank you. The grace that flowed from Calvary. So God, as we come to the cup and we remember the cost, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we partake? See, when we look at greatness, the way God sees it, we look at Jesus. We look at Jesus Christ and what he has done, and we praise his name. Let's praise him together, shall we? Mark? We're going to sing the chorus of that well-known hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We're going to sing through it a couple of times. If you wish to follow along, the words will be behind me. It'll also be number 340 in your hymn books. The words, though, go so beautifully with what we just heard from Philippians chapter 2. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Stand as we close, please. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the 
things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Dear Jesus, let us see you through our eyes so that the world around us can see you through us. In your holy name we pray, amen.